All right. I'm currently on the phone with Dana Jean. She's another musician that reached out about the current interview sessions. So I'm going to go ahead and give her the chance to introduce herself. Thank you, Alexander. Um, so my name is Dana Jean Walter, and I have been a musician and producer and director here in the Twin Cities for over 30 years now, doing various things. I'm one of those weirdo Renaissance Festival people. Um, I also uh, studied opera and jazz, uh, vocal performance wise, and I am currently an active sound healer in town where I do a lot of work with my voice as well as singing bowls and drumming. And um, got my training with Tom Kenyon back in 2011, back out in Seattle. And I own, co-own a uh, performance event space in East St. Paul called The She Shed, where we specialize in creatives coming together and collaboratively working on various kinds of projects, as well as uh, having an intimate performance listening room space for musicians and theater. So that's kind of my jam. My music uh, tastes have been all over the place, Irish choral, pop, uh, top 40. Um, I'm an eighties baby. So got to love my eighties music and yeah, just done a lot of stuff, pre uh, performed with some amazing, some of the best musicians I think ever here in the twin cities. And I have had a very, very blessed life that has led me to this moment in my mid fifties. <laughs> so awesome. Well, it sounds like you've been very involved for many years. Uh, let's kind of bite into that a little bit. Tell me about, you know, when this all first started for you, what was kind of the pivotal moment that kind of made you realize this was the path you wanted to take in life? My grandparents owned a all season resort in upper Northern Wisconsin. And when I was four, unbeknownst to it, not prompted by anyone. I jumped up onto the stage at the supper club one day and started singing along with Delta Dawn, like I was a pop star already. And it was precocious about that. And I, I got really scared of my voice when I was eight, when my grandpa had surprisingly taped me. And then I heard my voice on a recording and lost my mind. Cause I'm like, that's not me. And then I didn't, I only sang for myself or my mom um, until uh, my high school choral teacher in 10th grade was like, you're, you're a singer and you have a gift. And she kind of shoved me forward and said, you need to do this. And that really changed the whole trajectory of my life. It was pretty, pretty crazy. Okay. So uh, what was kind of the, the next steps after there? Once you kind of realized you had that gift and then you wanted to start owning it, uh, where did that lead you from there? Um, I knew um, one, with the support that I had from my choral director and my band teachers and theater people that performing on stage was something that I just had to do. Even as a, I'm a six foot five tall fat chick built like a siege weapon, which is not what people usually want to see on stage. <laughs> so, um, and despite all that, I knew that I had to go to school for music. I was an athlete in three sports a year. So I, and a farm girl. So I was a very physical person. I was a very, um, <clears throat> cause I grew so fast. I, I knew that performing was the place that no one could tell me I couldn't do something. And that's one of the greatest powers of the creative process that I think humans have is that through that, no matter what was being thrown at me from elsewhere in that place, I was fearless. And, um, that just kind of took me to college, which took me to jazz, which then took me to opera. And then I discovered the Renaissance festival at 19 and that was a whole explosion of everything. So. So let's let's touch base on the opera stuff. What was uh, you know the moment there that kind of made you realize that that might be where you belong? Um, you know, there's that that uh, it's not over till the fat lady sing, and there's uh, because I'm a dramatic Scorpio. There was always something uh, hilarious about that for me. Um, I I was very blessed with the teachers I've had, and I was accepted into. I did several years at UMD and then I came down here to the Twin Cities campus and as an undergrad was selected to work with someone who only worked with uh, doctorate and master's uh, people. So uh, Glenda was one of the best art 
um, singers, art song singers on the planet. And she was a big uh, Texan woman who was like Ursula walking on land. And she was a country singer and then discovered uh, opera and art song. I never actually wanted to do opera. Uh, they didn't have a jazz program down here. I was always really into jazz. And because they didn't have that, she exposed me to an even bigger realm of music. And so <clears throat> I actually didn't get to actually perform opera before I left school. After five years, I was having a crisis. And she said, your voice is older than your experience. And so it's okay for you to go take a break. But when you come back, I need a year's notice so we can plan entire seasons around you because we don't get voices like you very often. And it was hard because I have a very big voice in Minnesota is very much about small voices. And so it was very fish out of water, but I was used to that. So, um, and then I discovered the Renaissance Festival and did some of my operatic aria work out there, which was out of period, but it still was, I got to control thousands of people with my voice and went, this is awesome. So <laughs> that was, uh, great. So were you, uh, uh, working with the Renfest, you weren't just like a books talent kind of thing. Oh, I was I was hired as an actress and as a musician, but I didn't start as a musician. I actually fell in love uh, when I came out there with the Sword Fighters, and I saw the people doing stage combat. And I, lo other than music, I lost my mind. And then I went on and trained for years and years and years, learning every weapon I could get my hands on. And then ended up performing in the Renaissance uh, or the Robin Hood show and the human combat chess to the point where when I retired, I was, I had my, I had my own combat troupe. I had my own, I was directing and writing and producing and I'd created a stage out there for us. And it was just an amazing time in my life that has given me so much, uh, so many of the musicians I've worked with are people that I came to that crossroads out there and they are uh, world-class and I learned so much. So, so much. If you haven't ever had a chance to do the Renaissance Festival as a performer, do it. You'll never get an experience like it anywhere. Uh, but I, I have considered it many years ago and I had uh, a situation that we don't have to talk about that prevented me from doing <laughs> it. Um, in any case, um, it's so a very complex where did place, that Alexander? <laughs> it is. Yes, it is. Um, so tell me about um, what happened kind of between then and then where you are now. I tried to I've tried to grow up. <laughs> um and in so many ways, I mean, it's, you know, that's the island of misfit toys out there. So like fitting into corporate America is not my jam. And there are times I look back and I think, how was I doing like four different musical projects and doing theater projects and working a full-time job and having a couple side jobs? Like what, what, I mean, I know I'm a Gen Xer, but that's nuts. Um, I got sick in 20, uh, 15, um, I got cancer and I kicked its ass, thankfully. Um, and then it came back again five years later. And so I'm still in the midst of like fighting it off, but I've done so without chemo and radiation, thankfully, because I really believe in the power of music. And as a sound healer, I do a lot of work with other people in teaching them that and performing that modality for them, but also working on myself. So in that time, I locked into more of my spiritual practices along with my healing um, side of myself and got more training. I mean, we're always training, right? Um, and so I, and then in 2019, one of my um, friends and I started the She Shed in East St. Paul. And then of course, COVID happened and it, that was just killer. And so now <clears throat> I'm really focused on trying to figure out why people are not putting their butts in the seats. It's very frustrating as a local performer to see so many places drying up around the Twin Cities because they just can't stay open because people aren't coming. And they'll go to see Taylor Swift for $1,200 and mortgage their home for nosebleed seats, but they won't spend $30 or less to come see somebody performing local and supporting local businesses, is, and it's infuriating. And I don't know how to fix it. So I've been trying to uh, brainstorm with local theater producers and um, 
bar owners and things and trying to figure out what's the deal. Because I also think it shouldn't just be in places where we only have food and alcohol. Because uh, as a person who's performed in coffee houses and bars my whole life, there's nothing more annoying than when you're doing a power ballad or something and the coffee grinder goes off or a bunch of drunk people like or working St. Patrick's Day and people are just dripping by and they're all just a bunch of drunk people. You know, bless them. Hope they don't. But it's still as a musician, when you're pouring three hours out a night for really little money. You just want somebody to appreciate what you're doing and what you are creating with the people you're doing it with. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I'm performing with anybody, I have an intimate connection with them and there's stuff happening that's magic. And so I, I know that there's fans and people that dig it, that feel it too, but most of the people don't. And it's just very frustrating because you know, when you've been in a concert of your favorite artist and you're at some big venue and everybody's mind is together. Like that's what music can do. It's the, it's the universal language. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what language you're singing in. You get it. So uh, from where you are now, were you able to ever kind of revisit that idea of the she shed or uh, kind of work on any of those other projects? Well, we still have the she shed by Rook or by Crook. I mean, it's pretty scary right now. I mean, we're, we're in a thing where we're not sure if it will be able to remain in the coming months, but we're trying our best to do that. Um, I also am a theater producer, and so I haven't produced anything since probably just before I got sick. So getting back into that, this was the space that I was going to be doing some of that. But, um, you know, it's tough out there and it's a lot of grant money has dried up and a lot of a lot of things have changed in the landscape in the last six years. So uh, we're all kind of stupefied trying to figure out what are we supposed to do now? But and and still keep our passion. I mean, I don't know about you, but the COVID lockdown shredded so much of the bonding that was happening in the Twin Cities. I've had people I've talked to for years who've come from other cities like East Coast, West Coast, and they come through Minneapolis, St. Paul, and they're like, oh, you guys are so cohesive here. And I look at them and I said, yeah, everybody except the dancers, maybe, because they're their own <laughs> thing. But... But we do have a lot of co collaboration and cohesiveness here. We have a lot of diversity, both in music and performance and slam poetry and our drag and burlesque scene and our comedy scene. I mean, our comedy scene here is on fire normally. Um, and I have dear friends that are in that heavily. And it's just, it's frustrating to be in a city that's so diverse and see things treading. And I think this must be happening everywhere, not just here. So I'm, I'm, my, my desire right now is to solve this puzzle so that I can produce the things that I want to do because nobody wants to produce something and put that much effort into it and have two people in the audience. It's, you'll do it anyway because you have to. But it's just like I have, I'm also at 54. I'm like, everybody needs to get paid a living wage for what we do. I don't care what you're doing. If your skills and the effort that you've put into investing in your craft, in your in your professionalism, you should be able to walk away with at least $25 an hour. And I don't think that's unreasonable. But yet, the thing that bothered me the most is when COVID struck all over the planet, all the creatives came out to balm everybody. But we're the last ones who got to go back to work. And we have to societally look at that. Like it used to be that if you were an actress or you were a musician, you were a whore and you were less than, but yet you're the, the place that everybody goes when they need solace or when they need to have whatever medicine, because it's medicine that goes way, way, way back to earlier ancient times when people like us were in, we were running the temples. We were where people came to find solace and speak to spirit. And now, you know, it's like, Here's your, here's your busking tip money. Thanks. Like busker musicians are some of the most amazing musicians you will ever see. I can listen to anybody for the first time and go, ha, they're a busker. Because there's something that happens when you do that kind of work in your, in your craft that you can hear. And that's because you're, there is no fourth wall. You're in it. People can touch you. There's no stage lights. There's nothing. People can be absolutely right next to you while you're creating what you're doing. And I just think, yeah. To, to kind of uh, 
you know, pinpoint exactly where you're, I think you're headed with this. There is a healing power to music that, you know, comes out in those formats. Like you said, people seek that out to, you know, get solace, but essentially what they're trying to do is, you know, heal some sort of damage or trauma that they, they think some sort of performance art can, you know, solve for them. Yes. And you know, what's crazy, Alexander, is that we all think that being a musician or being a performer is special. It is special. We love it. We, we fall in love and have these para relationships with people in our TV shows and on the stage. And, and we, we look to them as mentors, but the reality is every single human on this planet, I don't care if you think you can't sing your way out of a piss soaked sack, you have the power in you to do that type of creative work. Will it take skill? Will, will you be the best? Maybe, maybe not, but every single person has that. Every single bird that's in the forest, people think that birds sing because it's pretty. No, they sing because they go, get the fuck out of my yard or, hey, do you want to have sex with me? I <laughs> yeah. mean, that's the, that's the law of nature. Nobody shows up to the swamp to sing in a chorus of frogs and they have a rehearsal. They just do their thing and they all sync up together. Cicadas, as annoying as they are, they all come out and make this noise because they're trying to have sex before they die in a day, you know? Like, yeah. I've heard, I've heard it described as, uh, everybody has the capacity for creativity. It's just that some people are a little better at it for themselves. Absolutely. And also I got this a lot as I, I did a floral design for over 30 years too. And I would be making stuff in front of customers and they would walk up to me and say, Oh, I could never do that. And I'd look at them and say, did you put that outfit together today? Well, yeah. Did you have any help with that? No. Then you could do floral design. <laughs> well, no, I can <laughs> And it's just because people are afraid. I mean, public speaking and singing in public are two of the biggest phobia fears that most people have. And yet we have karaoke, which I freaking hate. But yet I appreciate it for the social experiment that it is, because whether you're drunk or your friends cheer you on, you could go. I've seen people go up and just suck but they have so much fun and the audience is absolutely with them that's there's, magic there's such a a fine line in the differences between uh as you put it uh you know performing karaoke because when you're in that moment you're performing somebody else's material but when you're on stage performing your own material the judgment that is applied to that is just multiplied so much it can be. I think it can be. I think it's different for everybody. Like for me, I am not a writer. Um, when I do my sonic work, I am singing phonetically and I am letting the energy of my faith come through my body. Right. When I am singing an Annie Lennox song, I would love to be Annie Lennox. Oh my gosh. I worship the ground that woman walks on, but I'm not, I'm me, but I can love what she does and I can feel what she does when I sing it in my voice, but it's different. I think when, I think when it's your own song and you're singing it, it's very personal. I remember seeing Elton John and Billy Joel in their dual concert years ago. And Billy Joel wrote piano man. Everybody loves it. It's a very popular karaoke song, right? <clears throat> Nothing blew my mind. than when I saw this man stand at the target center in front of everybody and he didn't even have to sing the song. The whole audience was singing the song and he just held the microphone, microphone up to us. And I thought to myself, what must it feel like after you've sung this song for decades and now every single th multi tens of thousands of people arena you're in are singing your song back to you. What must that feel like? Right. And you think, and I've seen it, like I love BTS and I, I see that a lot when army sings their songs back to them and they get so emotional and you have seven grown men falling apart into tears on the, on the stage, because what amazing feeling that must be when they're not only singing it back to you in Korean and you're not in a Korean audience. I mean, can you even, I mean, that's just amazing to me. That's magic. Quite amazing. Um, all right. So we went on quite a wild tangent there. Uh, we, <laughs> we touched base world. on a bunch of, uh, you know, your projects and everything. Where can people find your projects and check you out? Um, you can go to the she shed .com, which is uh, the and then S is in Sam, I, D is in David, H, E, 
shed.com. That is she like the Fay, like the others. And uh, we're located in East St. Paul in the Hams Brewery Complex. Um, you can also find um, some of my previous work at Bandcamp at Pirates of Dreamtime, um, which was a, the last big group, which was one of my favorite groups I've ever done. And we have our album out there you can listen to for free or download for 10 bucks. Um, but yeah, that's basically the places that you can find me right now. I'm, I'm still re I'm still healing, um, a bunch of my own stuff. So hopefully, uh, you can catch some of our shows if we're able to still be there and please, 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 please. I don't care what it is. Go support your local venues and your local theaters and your local musicians and performers. Cause without you, we're dead in the water. I and, completely um, agree. I support that message. <laughs> Uh, all right. So I always like to give the person I'm interviewing the chance to put out their last word. So what's a message that you would like to put out there that you think people should hear? One of the biggest tenets that we believe in our uh, pillar of truth at the She Shed is that creatives will save the world. And um, not just the special ones. That means everybody. If you're a human being, you're a creative. The creative process is the most powerful uh, form of creation that you could ever possibly engage in. We destroy a lot of things, but we birth a lot of things. So lean into the birthing. And if you have been afraid to try to paint or sing or dance or juggle cats, do it. Um, because you'll be sad when you're dead and you didn't. So just do it anyway.